Hi, I'm Carlos Sainz, and you are listening F1 Weekly. There are fewer than 30 men in the world qualified to drive Formula One. A mere half dozen, perhaps, to win. At this moment, I'm inclined to think you are not one of them. Hello, this is Desiree for F1Weekly.com. I'm your in-depth correspondent. Let's go. Welcome to F1Weekly.com. My name is Clark Rogers. I'm the host of the program. I'll be joined by Nasser Hamid, my co-host. This is podcast number 830, May 4th, 2020. Nasser. Thank you, sir. I say greetings and stay at home regards. But Mr. Rogers, please brighten the day and the world with some Le NASCAR update. Thank you, Nasser. On today's program, the world is beginning to open up. The real NASCAR returns May 17th in North Carolina. Austrian Grand Prix will be the template for the rest of the season in terms of biospheres and race weekends moving forward. We have another installment of Gary Sloan, that crazy man from Scotland. And our next interview from the past will be Derek Daly and his son, Connor. Should be very interesting, great, informative interview. And of course, I want to remind everybody that we need your contributions to keep this program on the air. Just click on the Support F1 Weekly tab. You know you want to. Thank you, Nasser. Welcome to the studio. How are you? I'm doing very good, sir. We are in the month of May, and Mr. Rogers, you know, this is the month uh, we have to mention Emola 1994 and the very, very sad passing of Ayrton Senna and Roland Ratzenberger. So it's, uh, we are in tough times, and this uh, also was pretty sad news item, the anniversary, but, you know, these things happen and life goes on. How are things in Cali? Very good. California is wonderful, as you know. And of course, I know you are in Florida. And being a Floridian, I'm sure you were taken aback by the passing of Don Shula. Yes, sir. I always liked him. And of course, a legendary figure in the world of football. And, you know, back in the days, I used to watch a lot of NFL documentaries, so very familiar with him. So our uh, condolences to his family, and I'm glad you brought that up. Thank you very much, Nas. But there you have it. The world is finally starting to open up. We've got NASCAR coming up in a couple of weekends. What do you think? You, you get you getting hungry? Yes, there is always hope, and there has to be always hope. And you know, talking of hope, uh, uh, the you mentioned the Austrian Grand Prix. We will talk about that uh, later. But, you know, some interesting news item on Crash.net today that teams have agreed to a budget cap of $145 million, which is, you know, very impressive. And, of course, they want to take it down to $100 million, which I also think is a very good idea. Zach Brown has been very vocal about the self-serving agendas of well-funded teams. We know who they are, the Prancing Horse, the Raging Bull, and the shining star from Stuttgart. Amazing how things change. Once upon a time, McLaren had the best sponsorship package. So good they could get two legends of the sport at the same time. Sir, would you like to see what uh, Mr. Horner had suggested? Private teams. I would love that. What say you? That's the way it should be. I like it, Nas. But, you know, Lotus, team, Lotus cars got their first win through a private team. And uh, we used to have those in the 70s also. And I think this will be very good because then team, smaller teams will not have to spend $90, $100 million to uh, run a car. And more cars we have, the better it is. You know, back in the day in the old 14-mile uh, Nürburgring, when they, the track was so long, when they used to have the German Grand Prix, we're talking now the 60s and I think maybe early 70s, they would even allow Formula 2 cars. 
I, I think it would be a great idea. You know, it's going to even out the, the playing field. And let's see how, even though I think there's still going to be a lot of cheating. That's all I got to say. And because, you know, back in the days when we had HRT and uh, what were the other team, Katrum, if they had thrown in some G GP2 cars, I think those GP2 cars would, would have been faster than those F1 machines. And, you know, in that case, if a GP2 car was running a ahead of a couple of F1 cars, then the driver could really scream with excitement, GP2 engine! Ah! Are you finished? No, that's Kimi and Mika. So, shall we talk about the opening round of the 2000, what is it, man, I, I can't even figure out the year and the days these days. 2020 Formula 1 season opener in July, the Red Bull Grand Prix or Austrian Grand Prix. You know, they are planning on having two races um, uh, in Austria in July. I think they're going to have two races at every race. The problem is once you have that entire area secure, for the COVID-19, you hate to waste it on just one race. Well, the question is, you know, they can call one of the races Austrian Grand Prix and the other could be called uh, Red Bull Grand Prix. But what will happen when they go to other tracks and uh, uh, what names will they use? A, B, C, and D. Maybe they can use British Grand Prix and the English Grand Prix. Maybe they could do... One Corona, two Corona, three Coronas. Wow. How about a Corona Grand Prix followed by a Takate Grand Prix? And we could do H1N1. There you go. You know, in, in Austin, we can have the U.S. Grand Prix and the <laughs> George W. Bush Grand Prix. Thank you. Thank you very much. He was in the news lately. He's trying to unite the country, so I had to mention him. Everybody's trying to unite the country. We are trying to unite the country. We're trying to unite the world with the love of Formula One. Okay, well, why don't you open up a Coke and uh, start uh, smelling the news. Okay, I have a question for you. This is definitely going to be a short season. Do you think this could be Max's opportunity to end the runaway Lewis locomotion? Not in a million years. No, I think this will be a very good chance because, you know, you know, when Lewis overcame a 43-point deficit to Nico Rosberg, of course, Max is no Nico Rosberg, but he had a lot of races to catch up. But here, you know, if there is, um, let's say, a meltdown or a cablamo or somebody takes him out, and that's, I'm talking Lewis, and Max gets a 20, 25-point lead or 30-point lead, it'll be very hard to um, overcome that against... Uh, Somebody who's so quick and so feisty. And, you know, Max is just like, uh, I was watching some races. Man, this guy, Kevin Magnuson, boy, he, he it's hard to pass this guy. And Max is the same way. If Max is leading the championship with two races to go and Lewis tried to pass him, you know what he's ending. Pro Senna. Exacto, Mundo. Expecting anything else from the Grand Prix season uh, this season, sir, once it gets going, hopefully soon? I'm not sure, you know. I think there's going to be a lot of loving, people hugging, kumbaya. There's still going to be social distancing everywhere, so people will be wearing masks and gloves, and it's going to be awkward, and it's going to be very clinical, and uh, it's going to be a crazy season. I think we should have canceled the whole thing. Oh, no, not at all, sir. Oh, no, 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 no. But one thing for sure, there will be no Kumbaya for BJ Malia. They might be go back to India. The one-time king of good times is getting a taste of his own medicine. He has lost his appeal to stop, uh, to stop his extradition to India on charges of bilking billions of dollars, and that's dollars, not rupees, from state financial institutions. He will now have to appeal to Her Majesty's Supreme Court. Let's hope he does not call Lewis Hamilton for dress code advice when going to the High Court of Her Majesty. You know what is interesting? Carlos Goshen took a leave from his uh, uh, tea plant uh, because Dr. Vijay Malia was in India when the Indian Supreme Court issued a decree that they will serve a, serve a no exit uh, order on him that he cannot leave the country. And by the time they went to serve him at his palatial residence in Mumbai or whatever it was, uh, they were told why well, he is no longer in the country. Any thoughts on Dr. Vijay Malia, sir? No, I like him. I think he's a good guy. Yes, sir. Okay, now, Sebastian Fettel, much in the news that he may go to McLaren. Apparently, 
Italian media is reporting that Ferrari has made him, let's call it, these are not their words, but my words, an insulting offer, you know, too low of an offer where they're hoping that he will not accept. And a lot of rumors are that he will go to McLaren, which I will not be surprised because by the time he gets there, there will be a German engine there and it won't be a Trabant engine. And Andreas Seidel is there and apparently they had worked before many years ago. I can see Sebastian going there. What what, what say you? To McLaren? Si, senor. I don't think so. I, I don't see that. German Schmerman. You think he will play a second banana to... Uh, Charles Leclerc for minimum wage. Minimum wage in his case would be like a million a month. Yes. Isn't that lovely? It's better than, than being at McLaren. Yes, and you know Alain Prost was quoted in one of the magazines today or websites today that it is all up to Daniel Ricciardo. Looks like Renault is uh, mentally preparing for him to tell them, you know, au revoir, Monsieur Prost. Well, that's already settled. I saw it today. uh Ricciardo will be free for 2021. Yeah, I, I, I will be very, very surprised if he stays at Renault. No, he won't. It's over. But I'll tell you, even if he goes back to Red Bull, and even if Max has his number, they were so closely matched that I think if Red Bull Honda has the best package, that Ricciardo, he's more of a driver in the mold of a Nicky Lauda and a Alain Prost a thinking man's racing driver, that he can still beat Max for top, Max for stop into the championship in the same team. I think so. I, I don't. I don't think so. Well, we shall see if he goes there. JB Jensen Button is interested in doing some IndyCar racing along with Jimmy Johnson. Would you like to see Jens our Jens in IndyCar racing? Love to see it, man. I'll tell you that will be so fantastic if Roger Penske could at least get him to do some high-profile races. Of course, Indy is, you know, top of the pops. But if he can do some races like Long Beach, Toronto, oh boy, that will raise the profile of IndyCar racing big, big time, just like it did with Nigel Menso. What about Fernando? Well, he's already uh, into American racing scene. He has raced at Daytona, Indy already, and I think he will be back here. Is he confirmed with any team? Uh, the Indy 500, I believe, is now in August or September, right? Correct. Is your hombre confirmed uh, at some team already? Not yet, no. Okay, now we go to the old ma master, Mr. Bernie Ecclestone. He is quoted as saying, Somebody needs to tear up the rule books and really write new rules. We need to keep the basics of F1, but just get away from all these super high-tech things. I'd go back to normally aspirated engines, that make a bit of a noise and look exciting, end of quote. I have to agree with them on the normally aspirated engines. We do need the sound. What say you, sir, on what Bernie says? Well, you know, I agree with Bernie. You agree with Bernie. You know why? Because we're old. That's very true. That is very true. Thank you. Thank you very much. I love Matra. You love Matra. But we're old. You know, the, the, the new generation, Matra, they don't even know what that is. It's over. The final curtain is coming. We're barely going to make it off the stage, Nasser. Mr. Rogers, just the name Matra and Monza puts a smile on my face. So you can imagine what kind of, kind of frisson I get when I see a Matra MS120 at Monza Autodromo. Bravissimo, bravissimo, bravissimo. So, uh, so NASCAR season is starting this month. Are you sure 100%? Absolutely. Charlotte, North Carolina, huh? Yep, I, I got my chewing tobacco. Yeah, well, they have the big race on the memory. They used to uh, do on Memorial Day weekend, the uh, same day, actually, the World 600. So that will be interesting. Extremely. So shall we bring in Derek Daly and his Bambino? Connor Daly to the studios now? Yes, they just walked in the front door, Nash. Why don't you introduce this, uh, I would say, Papa and Son? Well, Derek Daly, you know, a fantastic story. I remember reading about him when I was back home a long, long time ago that he went to Australia to work in iron ore mines so he can save some money and go racing. And this is what these people did in those days, you know. Can you imagine today? Today's Formula 3 drivers, even go-karting drivers, are showing up to go-kart races in high-end Mercedes and Bentleys. And what a diff world of difference we have now. 
so Derek Daly worked hard, made it all the way to um, Formula One race for Frank Williams, and he shares his thought about Frank and Patrick Head. The interview with Derek was conducted at uh, Sebring many years ago. And uh, again, even though it's been a while, I would like to thank him and his son for their time. And now for another special F1Weekly.com interview. And now we're talking about a father and son reunion. Nass, please introduce these two gentlemen. Yes, sir. Uh, thank you. This is with Derek Daly and Connor Daly. Derek is the dad and Connor is the young American kid. Derek Daly made it, you know, names like Derek Daly takes me back to the, for, for me, the golden era of motor racing, the early 70s, when I started following this beautiful sport. So Derek Daly made it to Formula One on the Devo program, worked in iron ore mines of Australia to go motor racing, raced with Williams and Terrell in Formula One, and then raced for many years in Indy cars. He is now based in Indianapolis, and his company, Derek Daly Design, is in, uh, involved in designing race tracks around the world. And I would encourage our listeners to check out his website, which is www.derekdailydesign.com. The second part of the interview is with his son, Connor. Connor is 17 years old, and after a winning career in karting, he is now rapidly climbing the single-seater ladder. In 2008, he won the Skip Barber Championship with five wins. Representing Team USA also won the Walter Hayes Formula Ford 1600 Trophy at Silverstone. This year, he's taking part in Star Master Series, and his website is www.connordaily.net, and Connor is spelled C-O-N-O-R in his case. My sincere thanks to Derek. I really enjoyed talking to him and to his son, Connor, and I want to thank them again for their time at Sebring, which is where this conversation took place. Thank you. Okay, folks, I'm here with Derek Daly, a gentleman who went to Australia to work in coal mines to go motor racing. And I love that story. Tell us a little bit about that, please. It was a case back then where you just did whatever you had to do to get a chunk of cash if you wanted to buy a racing car. Um, and I heard of a, about an, an opportunity. I could either go to the uh, iron ore mines in Australia or the oil fields of, of Alaska. The choice to go to the iron ore mines was made because we had to spend a thousand pounds for clothing to keep us warm in Alaska and they were going to take that out of our pay pack and we thought nah that's no good we need all the money so we just cut the legs off our pants and cut the sleeves off our shirts and we were perfectly dressed for working in the mines in Australia how long were you there? Uh, six months of the winter of 73-74 and how much of uh, six months of uh, coal mine, uh, mine working in the mine brought you in terms of racing time? Well, if, in, in, well in, what, what, it, what, it, what it allowed me to do is I came back with 5,000 pounds, which in those days was $10,000. And I'd never seen that amount of money before. And, and so that allowed me to buy a Formula Ford, uh, which put me on the track to win in the Irish Formula Ford Championship. Uh, then I had a valuable championship winning car, which I sold. Uh, got reasonable money for that. I was going to be able to use that for the following season, which was 76 in England. And, and I, I, I had enough money to either race or to live, but I really couldn't do both at the same time. So to live, I just bought an old school bus, took all the seats out of it, put two ramps in the back, and ran the racing car into the middle of it. And I had a toolbox, a racing car, and a sleeping bag. And my mother made curtains for the, for the bus. My dad made a sponge mattress, and I said goodbye to my family. And that was it. I went to England to become a professional. And uh, you made it to Formula One. Um, what was the highlight for you in your Formula One days? I suppose the highlight was A, making it that far because I came from such a basic non-motorsports background. Um, events like the British Grand Prix, I finished fourth in the Tyrrell. I can still remember some of the corners in, in that car. The, driving the Williams, uh, places like Monaco, leading Monaco in 1982, about to start the last lap, the gearbox broke. Um, you know, that's, that's pretty heady times to live through for you know for someone who came from the background I came from and, and then just just to have the ability to mix with those type of people really people that you thought were on a different level until you got there and then of course I went to the Indy 500 because I was intrigued by this racing at 200 miles an hour between a concrete wall it just didn't make sense to me and the speeds were so high I went there in 83 for curiosity and I, I never left I, I've been there ever since 
Now, um, is Formula One really as intense and it, it is what it is as you hear while you're climbing the ladder? It is, without a doubt, the most intense class of racing on the planet. Formula One has this ability to put pressure on you just by its very existence. It is so results-driven that you automatically are pressured to get a result no matter what the circumstances. Um, and, and that type of pressure, I think you have to learn to absorb it, live with it, understand it, potentially use it to your advantage. But without a doubt, it is the most pressure-filled sporting environment in the world that flushes out every strength and every weakness in, in every person on the team, not just the drivers. Is Patrick Head uh, really a knucklehead that you hear, read in the reports? Well, Patrick Head is, is, is one of those geniuses. He, he, he is one of those people who quietly thinks levels deeper than most people. He wants to know why it works, how it works, and how he can come up with a better, more efficient way to make it work. And he, he is fueled by this almost driver-like desire to succeed. I mean, after all these years, he doesn't need any money anymore. But after all these years, he's still fueled with this great desire to innovate, to develop, to prove, and, and really to, to, again, wave the flag of what he and Frank as privateers now can do together. And that, I mean, that desire, I, I think, to dedicate your life to that is part of what this, uh, is part of what Formula One is. It's a lifestyle. It's not a job. It's a lifestyle. How was Frank to deal with? Frank was was a very black and white person. Um, Frank had no time for the emotion of the moment. Uh, very businesslike, black and white. Um, really didn't understand that certain environments bring out the best in certain people. It was come in, work, do it right, or get out. There's plenty more people to come and take your place. Um, which is understandable. Some drivers flourished in that, in the, in that environment. Some drivers didn't. Um, and I think Frank is still the same today. He's still black and white. Uh, still doesn't understand. Uh, for example, when Frenson went there, Frenson needed a bit of emotional support to get the best from him. Frank wasn't prepared to give that to him because he didn't understand what it meant. And Frenson, Frenson almost, his career almost died uh, at Williams. He goes to Jordan the next year and he almost wins the world championship. So he had the talent, he just didn't have the environment. Now, I remember you from your days with the Renault car, uh, Renault, Renault garage door in IndyCar racing, and you had a big accident. Uh, what were the highlights for you in your IndyCar? Uh, and how much did you enjoy oval racing compared to uh, Formula One circuit? Believe it or not, oval track racing was a bit of a strange animal because, in a way, racing on an oval, particularly a short oval, with a really good handling car, was what you thought racing always should be high speed, slipstreaming, passing, being passed, high action all the time. It's, it's what you imagined racing would be. Road racing, at, at the levels I did it, is so fast, the cars are so stiff, they're so abrupt, they're so abrasive, they're actually hostile environments. They're physically difficult animals to drive. So oval track racing had this, just this satisfaction feel when the car was good. Now, on the other hand, when the car was bad, it was by far the scariest, unnerving, most dangerous environment you could ever put an athlete into, without a doubt. And I got to, I got to experience both sides of what that looks like. Where is your, what is your homeboy, Eddie Irvine, doing these days? Um, growing his hair long, doing as little as possible, getting out of bed as late as possible, chasing as many women as possible, counting as money as often as possible. Uh, looking cool and uh, trying to prove to everybody that he could have been world champion if Michael Schumacher never existed. Yeah, quite a few people can say that. Uh, Formula One season is about to start. I want you to give me uh, this, uh, you know, settle this debate. People think Hamilton, and I asked Sterling Moss the same question, that Hamilton is, you know, spoon-fed success, everything worked out for him. How would you rate him as a race car driver? Well, first of all, let me tell you, I'm a big fan of Eddie Irvine's. <laughs> And I'll tell you what his greatest strength was, his mental strength. He absolutely mentally had it over most of his competitors. So, Hamilton, is he spoon-fed? I don't know. I don't really care. 
because the beauty about motor racing is even if you're handed everything on a place there is nowhere to hide when you have to go perform when you're asked by yourself to get in and go perform the eyes of the world are on you all your strengths and weaknesses come out so it doesn't matter what Lewis Hamilton had supposedly handed to him and he, and he had a good development path without a doubt he is true world class material that is potentially a model for so many people to follow um, I love what he's done I love what he's brought to the sport and the level of intrigue that he has brought has replaced the level of intrigue that Michael Schumacher left when, when, he, when he walked away who do, who do you think will win this year and who would you like to see win the championship this year the beauty about Formula 1 is you never know what's going to happen um, after recent testing who would believe that Jensen Button might win a race he might win 3 or 4 races if he wins 3 or 4 or 5 races he might be world champion with a new rule they just instigated if you look at past history I have a sneaky suspicion that BMW are going to be even stronger this year. They just have a measured, controlled approach that they, they seem to execute at a level as high, if not higher, than some teams. I can't imagine that Ferrari without Schumacher will continue to be as technically advanced as they need to be. Um, Ron Dennis has given up leadership at McLaren I don't know whether that will affect them or not so when you look at all that and look at Ross Braun is about to produce don't you think the intrigue of Formula 1 next year might be greater at a higher level than ever before and will Alonso package it and they say he's the safest hands in Formula 1 you know will he package a season long ability to bring another world championship for him I actually don't know, but it it's sure is a great amount of intrigue. You must be a very proud papa these days. Your son, Connor, is doing very well. How much are you involved in guiding his career? Um, I'm very much involved with, with guiding Connor's career. Um, I, I've been there, done that, made all the mistakes. So I try and use my experience to potentially guide him along a path that he tells me he wants to go along. Um, no matter what I can do for him, at the end of the day, it's a bit like Lewis Hamilton. When, he, when, when a driver jumps into the car, he's by himself. Um, so you then look at a driver, does he have... I mean, it's all great fun. Drivers love driving racing. It's great fun. Great to miss school for a week and go to Florida. But at the end of the day, you, you, you look at a package that is a driver, and, and does he have the innate ability... That, and to have the X factor, that little differentiating X factor that just puts him in a position to succeed, that allows him to, 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 to rise to the top when it's necessary, to get the momentum, to come on song at the right time. And so far, all through his go-karting and his Formula Ford in Canada and his Skip Barber, he's been able to do that. Now he's at a higher level. The challenge starts all over again. He's immediately fast in the Star Mazda Championship. And we'll see what he learns. We'll see how far he goes. And I, but I do tell him, his success in the future will not be dependent upon the team or what I bring or what he brings or what sponsorship brings. It'll actually be on what he himself is prepared to sacrifice, what he learns, what he does, how he applies himself. That will be the ultimate determining factor on how far he goes. Um, I do want to ask you a question based on a word you use, mistakes. What, what were some of the big mistakes you made, or what is the most common mistake young drivers make that hurt them in their career? From what I've experienced with many, many young drivers, very few of them understand the difference between a strength and a weakness. Very few of them would admit that they have a weakness. One of my biggest problems was I never knew I had a weakness. Nobody told me. I never understood it. So, nor would I ever admit it, um, because I wouldn't want anybody to even think of it. Little did I know, if I identify a weakness, work on it, turn it into a strength, and then add it to my natural strength, you become a powerhouse. And I find the same trends with young drivers today. So, I wrote a book that was published uh, about a year ago on driver development, and it's all about understanding the ingredients, understanding how to develop all those ingredients... And if you, if you have weaknesses, which every driver has, work on it, don't bury it, 
expose it, work on it, develop it, and then you can potentially become the very best you can be. And let's face it, what more could you ask for but to become the very best you can possibly be? Uh, Derek, I really appreciate your time. Finally, how about a message for listeners of F1 Weekly? And I'm very pleased to tell you we have listeners in your country also. Well, I love the fact that F1 Weekly is on the internet because you now have access to the world. Um, my family in Ireland can now listen to this. Awesome. So keep listening. Send messages every now and then. Tell your friends to tune in because uh, you will get information here that few get access to and it'll be broadcast around the world i love it thank you very much okay i'm here with the young happening dude of american motor racing connor daly connor welcome to f1 weekly how are you today i'm doing great excellent i remember your dad from his formula one days of course from his indycar days um tell me motor racing you know is it all because your dad is a racing driver uh, what's your uh, you know how deep is your love for motor racing well, I, I, motor racing is, is what I love most. I mean, I, I've played every other sport in America to do, and, uh, and motor racing is, is definitely where my heart is, and uh, it's just what I enjoy doing most. And uh, it's great to have a, a dad who's been through everything in the motor racing world, and, uh, you know, he's a great asset to me. Now, you were in karting. Uh, tell us about your karting experience, and how long were you in karting? Well, I did karting for, uh, since when I was 10 um, till about 15 years old. Um, it was it was it was a good time. I won a lot of, a lot of junior championships and uh, won a couple national championships and uh, and then just slowly moved, started progressing into the race car world and uh, that's been that's been where my life's been going ever since. Now recently, you and uh, Jeff Newgarden, uh, Jeff or Joseph? Joseph, Joseph Newgarden raced in Europe and had some success at the Formula Ford. Uh, tell us about that. Uh, this was at Brands Hatch, right? It was an incredible experience over there. We, uh, we we got to do the Formula Ford Festival at Brands Hatch and uh, the Walter Hayes Trophy at Silverstone, and it was it was an amazing experience to go over there as Americans. And uh, usually usually the Europeans picture us as, as less talented or or you know not not as good as them. So it was good to go over there and Joseph win the festival and and me win the Walter Hayes. So it was an incredible experience overall. Now uh, up till now, how much uh, single seater racing have you done in the U.S.? Well, at last year I did the Skip Barber National Championship, um, and I won that, and that was really my first full year in cars. The year before I had done some karting and cars, but last year was really my first full year. I also did the Canadian Formula Ford Championship last year, which I finished second, won Rookie of the Year, won six races in a row, the last six. And uh, then now this year will be my first year in the Star Mazda Championship, so it uh, should be a good year. Now, when you moved from karting to single-seater racing, what was the biggest adjustment? Well, I think the biggest adjustment would be the that has to be the weight. The weight of the weight of the cars is is so different to get used to from a small, nimble go kart, um, and also the downforce. I mean, obviously, go karts you don't have any downforce or aero ability, and then and then now in the Star Mazda cars, we have you know big wings and big downforce and high speed. So it's just there's a lot to learn, and I'm still trying to learn as much as I can at a, at a fast pace. All racing drivers want to win. What is your goal uh, in this uh, Star Mazda Series this year? My goal definitely has to be uh, to win. I mean, I, every driver wants to win, but, uh, you know, that, that winning comes with me being able to learn as much as I can as quick as possible. So if, if, as long as I can get a lot of learning done in these first couple races and get some good points, and uh, hopefully we'll be there at the, at the, end, of the end of the season to win the championship. Formula One has to be the goal. Uh, what is your career path that you would like to do, let's say, for the next three years? The next three years is, is, is kind of difficult. I mean, uh, if I win this championship, then Mazda pays for me to drive in the Atlantic Championship. So, And it seems like that championship is, uh, is on the rise again. So hopefully hopefully that would be a good thing for next year. And then after that, you know, I'd, I'd like to make the move to Europe. Um, hopefully this year I'll actually be able to start testing some F3 cars or something like that. And uh, just kind of keep my foot over there, and uh, you know, just start relationships with some people over there. So you know, you know well, it it all depends on and on how much I win and how how well things go. So we'll see. I'm sure Dad can open or at least introduce you to a lot of people. But let me ask you a question: Since your dad has been there, he probably won't buy any excuse from you. Uh, uh, so it, do you sometimes feel like, man, I wish my dad was not a racing driver? I don't know. He has he has a lot of information to offer, but you know, some sometimes he 
he does he does get on my nerves I, I do admit but you know he's he's always there to help and uh, his advice is, is always very helpful so I, I, you know it's it's great to have him around based on a little racing experience you had at Brands Hatch uh, you, when you race overseas uh, do you feel the difference in the level of uh, aggression of the drivers we're talking on the track uh, or the depth of the talent well I think uh, America has a lot of talented drivers as well as Europe um, it's just a different style of racing from country to country um, but it, it, it's good I'd say that the level of aggression is definitely different because of the the different rules that they have over in Europe I mean there's obviously a lot of defensive driving allowed over in Europe and, and in America here not so much so it, w- it was it was good for me to learn and get used to the defensive driving aspect and uh, you know it's really hardcore racing really is what it was so you know it, 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 it was it was it's great for me to you know put in my memory bank and, and, and learn for the rest of my life. And I have a few questions. You have to give me one or the other, okay? Lewis Hamilton or Fernando Alonso? That's a difficult one. I, 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 I definitely, I like both people, but uh, I, I think Lewis is, is who, I, who I'd like to see winning from now on. Milka Duno or Danica Patrick? Oh, Danica Patrick, for sure. Danica, she's, she's, a, she's a good driver and a good-looking girl as well. Good. Now, uh, the season is starting re- uh, very soon, Formula One. Uh, what are your expectations? Formula One, well, Formula One will be definitely an interesting season uh, with uh, the new Ross Braun GP team setting some quick times in testing. That'll be uh, it'll be interesting to see how well they do in race pace. But uh, I mean, I can't wait to see the season start. I mean, the cars are a bit interesting looking, but uh, it should be a good season. And finally, how about a message for listeners of F1 Weekly Worldwide, please? Oh, my website's www.connordaily.net. Um, and, you know, hopefully everyone can see me progressing the motorsports ladder, and uh, yeah. I hope to meet a lot of people along the way. And don't forget the F1 Weekly and the poor people of Paris when you make it to Formula One. Oh, I will definitely not forget. <laughs> it's now on record. Thank you very much. Thanks. Thank you. Derek and Connor, thanks for joining F1Weekly.com. So why don't we take a quick break and we'll be back after these brief messages. Hi, I'm Juan Pablo Montoya and you're listening to F1 Weekly. Welcome back to F1Weekly.com. Clark Rogers here, your host. And now here's Gary. Hello, listeners. My name is Gary Sloan and this is this week's edition of In the Pit Lane. Is Saudi Arabia increasing its involvement in F1 with latest developments maybe revealing their true ambitions? Well, firstly, back in March, we had the long-term global sponsorship deal announced between the state giant Armico and F1. Armico justified their sponsorship by saying F1's global fan base connected it to an engaged audience of 500 million fans and allowed it better to communicate its success stories to the world. Well, there may well be truth in this, but it was widely speculated at the time the Saudis had effectively made a down payment to host a race outside the capital Riyadh from 2023 onwards. F1, of course, were attracted by the estimated $50 million hosting fees the kingdom would have to pay, which would certainly offset the reduced fees recently agreed with some of the European circuits. Now, of course, the human rights question comes to the fore, and it suffice to say that it's claimed that Saudi Arabia is attempting to sports wash its pure human rights record. In fact, Amnesty International says Saudi Arabia has, and I quote, an appalling record on LGBT rights, women's rights, extrajudicial killings, beheadings, the murder of journalist Jamal Khashoggi, and their involvement in the ongoing conflict in Yemen. Now, Formula One counters this criticism by saying that it is a non-political organisation. Defending the sport, a spokesman for Formula One, state, Formula One stated, We take our human rights responsibilities very seriously and make this position clear to every race promoter and host country. We believe that working with countries and giving their citizens the chance to attend global sports and entertainment events is in fact a force for good. So if we leave aside for now the human rights question, it's fair to say Saudi Arabia is committed to holding sporting events as part of a strategy to attract tourists and improve its international image. It already hosts Formula E, heavyweight boxing title fights, Spain's Football Super Cup, and the world's richest horse race, the $20 million Saudi Cup. It's also been rumoured that unidentified Saudi investors, most likely the state sovereign wealth fund, 
are in talks with Gene Haas to purchase his Formula One team. Trying to counter some of the opposition to such investments, the narrative coming out of Rehad on human rights is that they have announced to abolish flogging as a form of punishment and they will no longer impose the death sentence on those who commit crimes as minors. So with the Saudis' sponsorship deal, hosting a race, and the possible purchase of a Formula One team, does their ambitions with Formula One end there? Well, I do not think so, as our old friends Liberty Media may well be in fact in secret negotiations with the Saudis. How come? Well, Liberty Media holds a 33% stake in Live Nation, a company which promotes, operates and manages ticket sales for live entertainment in the United States and internationally. Now, this firm has been particularly hit hard by the coronavirus pandemic because essentially all concerts and sporting events around the world have been cancelled for the foreseeable future. So step forward Saudi Arabia's Sovereign Wealth Fund who have just purchased a 5.7% stake in Live Nation. This now makes the Saudis and Liberty Media boardroom partners. One of Liberty Media's group's other major investment is, investments is the Atlantic Braves baseball team. Now, COVID-19 has taken its financial toll here, with profits of $54 million in 2019, crashing to an estimated loss of $60 million in 2020. So with Liberty's F1, Live Nation and Atlantic Braves holdings all in a financial straitjacket, will Liberty Group's owner, John Cable Guy Malone, be now forced into a deal with Saudi Arabia, who then become the de facto owners of Formula One? Well, maybe not so quick. Saudi Arabia is not without its problems. Its central bank foreign reserves fell in March at their fastest rate in at least 20 years and to their lowest level since 2011, while the kingdom slipped into a $9 billion budget deficit in the first quarter as oil revenues collapsed. Faced with oil prices heading south of $20 a barrel, the kingdom is losing money at an alarming rate, and with oversupply coupled with falling demand, no end in sight soon. So how long will it be for voices within Saudi Arabia to call for their ever-decreasing ever resources to be used for their kingdom's population instead of Crown Prince Mohammed bin Salim's Formula One ambitions. Well, that's it for another week. My name's Gary Sloan. I'm the author of In the Pit Lane, F1 Exposed. It's available at all good online retailers, Amazon, Apple, Barnes & Noble, Kobo, Google. But until next week, stay safe and stay well. Gary, keep up the good work. You're a crazy man, but that's why I like you. And now, as we spin the globe and go around the world with Motorsports Mondial, the king, the Swami himself, Nasser Hamid. Thank you, Mr. Rogers. Since we are eagerly, eagerly waiting for the opening round of the 2020 season, today's segment is called The Opening Round and look at all the different places, nations, and countries and tracks that have hosted the very first race of the season. Of course, for time consideration, we're not going to talk about each and every issue. But we, we all know by now the very first Formula 1 Grand Prix, Championship Grand Prix, was in 1950 at Silverstone. And now we're going to look at some other nation that played host to round number one. I will try to go alphabetically. Argentina, they had the first race of the season in 1973, the season I got hooked on phonics and Formula One. The opening round was, as always in Argentina, Buenos Aires, and won by Emerson Fittipaldi in a Lotus. The uh, race, uh, Emo considers this race as his best race because he was way down on Francois Sivet and caught him and passed him. So good for Mr. Fittipaldi. The first time Argentina hosted the opening round was in 1953. This was the first Formula One Championship Grand Prix outside Europe. Grand Slam, pole, fastest lap and race victory was achieved by Alberto Ascari in a Ferrari. Australia, 1996, walk in the park for Team Willie which would be Williams. JV started on pole on his F1 debut, but had to settle for second in the race behind teammate Damon Hill. Albert Park has been the season opener for most part since then, and of course we all know what happened this year. And talking of Jacques Villeneuve taking a pole on his Grand Prix debut, two other drivers did that. One was uh, Mario Andretti in 1968 at Watkins Glen in his Lotus, and the other was Carlos Reutemann in his home country driving for Bernie's Brabham team. Bahrain was the season opener in 2006 
And I think Australia could not be the season opener because they had Commonwealth game or some other sporting event going on. So in Bahrain in 2006, Nando was the winner for Renault over Michael Schumacher. Kimi was third and his teammate was fifth, our favorite JP Montoya. Your personal favorite from Manteca, California, Scott Speed was 13th in his Toro Rosso. Remember those days, uh, Scott Speed and Montoya in Formula One? Those were the great days, weren't they? Laughs, laughs, and laughing. Yes, sir. Now we come to not Brazil 66, but Brazil 76. James Hunt on pole in his McLaren. Frenchman Jean-Pierre Gerrier set the fastest lap in his shadow. And Nicky Lauda was the winner in his Ferrari. Tom Price from Wales was third in his shadow. Later in the year at Kailami, Price lost his life in a vicious accident, which took the life of a young track marshal. And you know, Tom Price is from, was from Wales, and he was a childhood friend of Mr. David Richards of Pro Drive. Small world. Now we come to Monaco. No Grand Prix this year, but the glitz and glamour capital of Formula One hosted the grand opening of the 1959 season. Maiden win for Jack Brabham in Monte Carlo and also for the Cooper team. There were three Americans in the race. Phil Hill was the top finisher in fourth, while Pete Lovely from Seattle, Washington area did not qualify. And you may know this, sir, since you live close to uh, Laguna Seca. Pete Lovely is the man who won the first ever race at Laguna Seca back in the late 1950s. Netherlands. The race at Sanford opened the 1962 season, and this time we had first ever win for Graham Hill in his BRM. There were four American racers in this event. Phil Hill was again the top man in third place. Interesting, you know, back in the day, we used to have a lot of Americans, and now it's been since 1978 since uh, an American won a Grand Prix race. That's pretty sad. Now we come to U.S. Grand Prix, or United States, I should say. Long Beach Grand Prix, also known as LBGP. Clark, did you ever go to any of the F1 races at Long Beach? I did not, sir. I refused. Do, have you ever been to any of the IndyCar races? No. Anyway, Long Beach Grand Prix, also known as U.S. Grand Prix West, started the 1981 season. Men from Padua, or Padova, as they call it in Italy, Ricardo Patrese was on pole in his arrows. Williams 1-2 was led by Alan Jones from Australia over Carlos Reutemann from Argentina. Third man on the podium was Nelson Piquet for Brabham. The 1991 season also started in the U.S. The honor this time went to Phoenix AZ. Moa was there. Now listen to this, sir. After paying Southwest Airlines a round-trip fare from Oakland to Phoenix, believe it or not, only $40, and that was returned, $40. My taxi ride from airport to Casa was much more than that. The race was won by Senna, and I'm so glad that I got to see the yellow helmet win at least one race. So that's a very, very happy moment for me. And the heat was beautiful, Clark. I got to tell you that even in March. Now we come to South Africa. All was not quiet on New Year's Day in 1965 as the nation hosted the first race of the season in East London. Grand Slam was done by Jim Clark, taking pole fastest lap and victory in his Lotus. The podium was an all-British affair with John Surtees in a Ferrari second and Graham Hill third in a BRM. Now we come to Switzerland, land of cuckoo clocks, rang the opening bell of the 1951 season at the Bramgarten Street Circuit, and Fangio, won, the great Juan Manuel Fangio, was the winner. So there you have it, sir, some famous round one opening round as we wait for the opening rounds in Austria. And of course, it will be no spectators. I think there will be, my guess is any races that will take place probably will be no spectators. Well, they decided that no spectators could be frightening. So for each seat, each seat will have a cardboard cutout of Fernando. Oh, that's a very good idea. And he'll be sitting in his camping chair. Yes, that's the way to go. I think I think somewhere in the general general uh, viewing area, standing only, maybe they should have a life-size cutaway drawing of uh, Ron Dennis and... Uh, 
somebody from Honda's engine department. Thank you. Nobody can. I was, you know, if you go to Autosport website on the YouTube, they are putting a, a Sky Sports is doing the same thing. They are putting a lot of interesting features, you know, to keep people exciting. And one of one of the recent was uh, famous radio messages, and of course, the Suzuka message was there along with the scream from the guy who was doing the reading. So this is one for the ages, man. But the one that for me, the one that even higher than that is karma. The karma, you know, is beautiful. I mean, if Sena had said karma about Pross or Pross had said karma about Schumacher, I can understand. But Alonso saying about Julian Palmer, oh my God. That's just, uh, uh, just like... Uh, Creme de la creme. Anyway, keep up the good work, Nass. I want to thank everybody who listens. Good night. Bye-bye.